I want to continue my series, our series, really. Bobby preached last week, but it's all been part of the same series, entitled How to Live the Good Life. How to Live the Good Life. And we had some scriptures that had to do with, uh, pointed out the fact that God actually does want us to live a good life. And the keys that we've been talking about to living a good life, you have to trust and you have to obey. Those two things. If you learn how to trust and you learn how to obey, I guarantee you, you're going to have a good life. I didn't say a perfect life. I didn't say a life without problems, but a life that when you get to the end of it and look back, you can say, thank you, Lord. That was a good life. No regrets. We have to trust that when God tells us to do something, whether it's out of his word or by his Holy Spirit, that he knows what he's talking about and it's for our good. It's for our best interest at mine. And then we have to simply obey. We got to do what God tells us to do. You know, James wrote in James chapter one, he said, if you keep hearing the word and you don't do it, then you deceive yourself. You move into a place of deception. The problem with being deceived is that you think you're right when you're absolutely wrong. That's the tough part about, about being deceived. You think you're right, but you're wrong. And we don't want to go there. So we need to learn how to be doers of the word of God, not just hearers. Now, I want to get specific today. We've been talking about obeying the commandments of God. And so uh, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. And I'm sure everybody here loves Jesus. You want to please him with all of your heart. And that's why you're here this morning. Uh, but the big question is, okay, I want, to, I want to obey God. I want to do what he wants me to do. But, but what is it exactly that he wants me to do? I mean, how do I know that I'm actually hitting the mark? Well, I want to share a couple of scriptures this morning and, and then four points to explain this to us this morning. So here's scripture number one, Matthew 22. It says, one of them, an expert in the law, tested Jesus with this question. He said, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord God with all of your heart with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And then again in John 13, he said, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So, a lawyer approached Jesus with a trick question, at least in his mind. You know, the re religious folks were always trying to stump Jesus, ask a question he couldn't answer, uh, try to put him in a hard place. Um, but so he asked this question, probably not thinking that Jesus was going to be able to answer that, uh, but Jesus quickly came up with an answer. It was a really a no-brainer. Do you know in the Old Testament, I think the reason it probably... Uh, amazed this lawyer that Jesus so quickly came up with an answer because in the Old Testament uh, they had 613 commandments to obey. Can you imagine? You could live half your life trying to figure out which ones you were obeying and which ones you were breaking. 613. And so this lawyer figured out there's no way that Jesus is going to be able to synthesize 613 commandments down to one, the most important. But that was a no brainer for Jesus. He immediately knew what the answer is. He said, man, it, this is it. It's right here. The first and the greatest commandment is to love the Lord God with all of your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and your strength. But Jesus knew that you had to get that right or nothing else in your life is going to be right. If you don't get that right, if Jesus, if, if the Father, loving God is not the central aspect of your life, everything else is going to be empty. You could have success in business, you could have lots of accomplishments in your life, but if there's going to be an emptiness, there's going to be a void if God is not number one in your life and you're not pursuing him with all of your heart. Why is that? Because God created every single human being with a God-shaped void on the inside. And the only way that you're going to fill that is with God. How many tried filling it with something else and realized it doesn't work? You can't fill that void with anything else. It's just not going to work. People spend a lifetime doing that, spend thousands of dollars, ruin their health, trying to fill the void, the emptiness, the restlessness, what's the meaning of all this, with all kinds of stuff, 
but the only thing that's going to fill it is a deep and personal and intimate relationship with Almighty God, right. with Father God. Now, this lawyer, he didn't ask for commandment number two, but Jesus offered it anyway. He said, there's a second commandment. Here's number two in the order, and it's, and it's like it. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. So our, our second highest priority, first is loving God, but the second is to love people. Now, isn't that simple? Jesus boiled down 613 commandments, and he said, you know, don't worry about that other stuff. Just do these two things, love God and love people. Amen. Love God and love people. You get that right, and everything else will fall into place, right? You know, the world says, use people to get what you want. But God says, love people the way that you want them to love you. Yeah, totally different. You know, I think it's amazing, even though God has a universe that's bigger than we can even imagine to attend to and to think about, He's more interested and more passionate about, about people on this planet called Earth than any other thing. He, do you know he's just, did you know he's actually madly in love with you? I mean, he is so passionate about every single human being. This is the focus of his attention. And he sacrificed a lot to get you into relationship with him. And because he loves people, then he wants us to love people as well, just like he does. So Jesus said, basically, you focus on loving God, loving people. You throw away the other 613 commandments because you will, in loving God and loving people, you will fulfill all of those commandments. It's not like you're, you're throwing them out and you, you, know, you don't even care about them. You're actually fulfilling those commandments simply by loving God and loving one another. And Paul wrote about that in Romans 13. He said, the commandments... You shall not commit adultery. He's talking about the Ten Commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And whatever other commandment there are, 613 of them, are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself, for love no, does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Love is the fulfillment of the law. Galatians 5.14, he said basically the same thing. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, isn't it true if you actually love someone, you're not going to steal from them. If you love someone, you're not going to lie to them. If you love your wife, you're not going to cheat on her, right? I mean, if you love God with all your heart, you're not going to worship some man-made idol. And so in loving God and loving people, we fulfill uh, all of the law and all the prophets. Well, I want to give you four, four quick points this morning about love. We're going to kind of dive into love because that's the commandment. Talking about obeying God, doing what God wants us because there's blessing and obedience. We established that in, in, in the series number one, that obedience brings blessing in your life. Now, I know we live in a day and age of grace and I thank God for grace, but God still blesses obedience. He blessed it in the Old Testament and he blesses it in the New Testament. There's a blessing that comes when we learn how to uh, obey the word of God and the voice of God. So here's point number one, love is a command. Love is a command. John 13, he said, a new command I give you, love one another. Now it's not a suggestion, it's not a recommendation, it, it actually is a command. God is commanding us to love one another. Now, some of you might be thinking, God, how can you command me to love people? I thought love was just something that kind of happened to me, and I had no control over it, and, you know, it comes, and then sometimes it goes, and, you know, just the way it is. Well, we got to understand the difference between the world's idea of love and God's idea of love. The world's idea of love is that it is a rush of emotions. It is a pitter-patter of the heart. It is a, it is a uh, irresistible attraction, sometimes a fatal attraction, but it is a irresistible attraction that I can do nothing about. And I either love you or I don't love you. That's the world's idea of love. You know, I have a, a knack when I go to the grocery store of picking the slowest checker in the store. I mean, almost without fail. And so I have plenty of time to kind of glance over the magazines that are up there, you know, the tabloids and that thing, you know, kind of twiddling my thumbs, looking at the headlines and everything. 
You know, and just every month, you know, whether it's People Magazine or something else, they have the latest Hollywood couple that have suddenly fallen madly in love. And this is the perfect couple, man. This is it right here. And then, like six months later, maybe a year later, that same couple is on the cover of the same magazine, but this time they have fallen out of love magically somehow, and they're in the divorce courts fighting over the money, fighting over who's going to get the money. And that's the world's idea of love. Whoops, you know, somehow I just fell out of love. I don't know how that happened. You know, when you get down to it, and I don't want to step in on anybody's toes here this morning, but I'm just going to be truthful with you. When you get down to it, human love is really fairly shallow and selfish. When you get down to it. You know, it shows up when we feel like we're going to get something out of the relationship. That's when human love uh, shows up. And really, it doesn't take much to run out of human love. Just have somebody talk behind your back, criticize you, take something that doesn't belong to you, whatever it is. And pretty soon, that love, it just runs thin, and it's, it's gone. It's out the window. But God can command us to love because he's talking about a different kind of love. He's not talking about an emotion. And here's the deal. God has already given us the kind of love that he wants us to love other people with. God never asks you to do anything that you cannot do. And so if God has commanded us to love one another, he didn't say pick and choose. He just said love everybody. If God's commanded us to do that, then he's given us already the capacity to do that. 1 John 4, uh, 7 and 8 says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Where does love come from? Love comes from God. And really, that's the only place that real love comes from. John goes on to say, Everyone who loves has been born of God. And knows God, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. So if you have been born again, how many have been born again today? You received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you have been born again, then the love of God is dwelling on the inside of you. Because when you were born again, the Bible says, old things have passed away. You become a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away, and all things have become new. That means the old nature was crucified with Christ, and God's new nature of love, because God is love, His new nature of love has come to live on the inside of you. And so when God has commanded us to love, he's not talking about that little surface, selfish human love. He's talking about drawing from that nature of God's love on the inside of us, that well that cannot be drained, cannot be dried out, and and love out of that love. That's what he's talking about. He's already given us the capacity to do that. God's, listen to what, Paul said in Romans 5, verse 5, he says, the hope does not put us to shame. Why? Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. God's already done it. The love that he wants us to love with, the love that he's commanded us to love with, God's already poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And we can, begin, we can learn how to love out of that love. God's powerful, unconditional, sacrificial love has been poured out into our heart. Now tell somebody next to you, man, you are a lean, mean, loving machine. Go ahead and tell them. Well, I don't know about the mean part, but uh, I'm not even sure about the lean part, but... Uh, The loving part, yeah, you got that one. Okay, point number two. See, love is a command, but number two, love is also a decision. God's commanded us, but we have a free will, and we can either choose to obey God or not. We can choose to love or not. Love is a decision, not just an emotion. It's great when the emotions are there. Emotions can be there. But you know you can love people even if you don't feel like it? That's because love is not the same as like. You can love people you don't like. There might be people, you might not even like your kids, but you can love them. 
<laughs> you might not like your spouse all the time, but you can love them. You might not like that cranky boss, but you can learn to love him or her. Hallelujah. You know, the problem is that we've watered down this word love so much that it's almost meaningless. You know, we say, I love chocolate cake, and I love that TV show, and I love the Patriots or whatever. <laughs> I knew I'd get somebody with that one. <laughs> but I want to give you the biblical definition of love this morning. Anybody want that? You know, the world tells us what love is. We fall in and out of it, trip over it. But biblical love, here's a definition. Biblical love is a decision to compassionately seek the well-being of another. There it is right there. Biblical love is a decision to compassionately seek the well-being of another. You know, I heard of an elderly Christian woman who was a, just a godly saint of a woman, kind, but she had some relatives who were trying to cheat her out of some uh, inheritance and some business dealings, and so they were kind of going behind her back, trying to cheat her, talking behind her back, criticizing her. All, just all this negative stuff was going on. And some of this lady's friends heard about it, and they were incensed, and they said, what are you going to do about that? And she said, I'm choosing to love in this situation. I am choosing to love in this situation. Every time they ask her about it, that was her response. I am choosing to love in this situation. Love is a decision to compassionately seek the well-being of another. That's why God can command us to love. That's why God can even command us to love our enemies. Did you know that? That God commands us to love our enemies? Not just the people we don't like very much, but the people who are actually trying to hurt us, take, take advantage of us. God says, I want you to love them. Amen. How can I do that? Well, it's that love of God that he's already poured out in our hearts. And when we learn how to love that way, there is nobody that can make us stop loving. There's nothing they can do. They can abuse us. They can take advantage of us. They can try to use us. But they can't stop us from loving them with the love of God. Amen. You know, I just heard this week, uh, there was a father who was telling a story about his son. He was down at uh, Bethel Church and saw the video clip of this, but the father was telling about his, his son, who in high school was just a fire evangelist. I mean, it, parents were that way, and they kind of raised him to just be witnessing all the time, witness on the streets, Share Jesus with everybody you come in contact with. And so he was doing this in the high school. He just witnessed everybody, including the gangs. I think this was down in California. There were some gangs uh, at the school that he was attending. And so he, he would even witness the gangs, and they hated him for it because uh, their girlfriends would get saved and stop having sex with them. And so then they would get mad at this, this kid, you know, for what he was doing. And, uh, you know, they actually beat him up every time they had an opportunity. I mean, they'd pound on him. And this kid would go home, you know, week after week with bruises and cuts and all this stuff going on. He tried to hide some of it from his parents, but most of the time they, they could see what was going on. Well, it came to the point, the gangs got so angry with him that one day they decided, this is it. We're going we're gonna to put this guy at a commission. So they, they attacked him and they beat him mercilessly until he actually fell unconscious. I mean, they beat him with their fists and they kicked him and literally knocked him into unconsciousness. And then they drug him out to the mi middle of a busy street and left him there, fully intending that a car would come by and hit him and kill him. Well, some passerby saw what was going on and they, you know, they pulled him out of the street, pulled him to safety. But here, here's what happened. While they were beating him, they kept saying, we hate you, and we're going to kill you today. And that high school kid, that Christian kid, he looked up at them through blood-stained eyes, and he said, you can, you can hate me, and you can kill me, but I'm going to love you with every last breath that I have because Jesus Christ loves you, and he lives in me. Well, this is what happened. Over the next year or so, every single one of those gang members gave their heart to Jesus Christ. Every single one of them. And a few years later, when, when he, the high school kid got married, one of those gang members was his best man at his wedding. 
Hallelujah. That's the love of Jesus. There's nothing greater in the universe. There's nothing more. It's the most powerful force in the universe. The unconditional agape love of God. Nothing can withstand it. Hallelujah. That's like a modern day David Wilkerson story, isn't it? Hallelujah. The love of God. Tell your neighbor, I want some of that. And the third point is this. Love, it's a command. Love is a decision, but love is also an action. Love is an action. We need to stop thinking of love as just a noun and start thinking of it as a verb. Love can be a verb. And love in the verb form is defined as to show kindness to somebody. The most important word of that definition is the word show. It means to show, S-H-O-W, to show, to demonstrate kindness to somebody. It's not just something we feel, it's something we show. It's something that we do. Amen. Yes. The Apostle Paul understood this, not Paul, but John. 1 John chapter 3, this is what he wrote, 1 John 3, 16. By the way, if you want an interesting study, look up in the New Testament all the 3 16s. Look up every third, chapter 3, verse 16. It is amazing how many incredible doctrinal statements are found in, in the 316. John 316, for God so loved the world, you know, and on and on it goes. It's just, just, I don't know why that came up, just an interesting little study you can do sometime. This is 1 John 316 through 18, and he writes, this is how we know what love is. You know, people in the world got it confused. They have no idea. But this is how we know how, what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and he sees a brother in need, but he has no pity or compassion on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Then he finishes, dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and truth. It's not love just with words. Words are cheap. Words are cheap. Now, I like to hear people say, I love you. But really, anybody can say that. We can say that and, you know, just out of our mouth it comes and never give it a second thought. But if you really want to love someone, show them. Amen. Do something. Love not just with words and tongue, but with action and in truth. There was a dad who took his two little kids, Brandon, age five, and Helen, age eight, to the mall one day, and when they pulled in the parking lot, they saw a big sign that said Petting Zoo. There was a big Peterbilt truck there, and, and uh, they'd had all, they had all kinds of cages out there with dozens and dozens of these little furry animals that kids could you know, pay a little money for and, and get in there and, and, and just spend some time petting those. And Helen, the eight-year-old girl, she absolutely loved animals. She, she just absolutely was head over heels, any kind of thing that had feet and fur, you know. And uh, so when they pulled into the, in the mall parking lot, they saw that sign. The kids just squealed, Daddy, Daddy, can, can we go? Can we go? And Daddy said, sure, you know, no, no big deal. And so he flipped them both a quarter each and says, I'm going to be right next door in the hardware store. And so he went in the hardware store and they went over to the petting zoo and, but just in, in, in like three or four minutes, here comes Helen into the hardware store. And Dad saw her and wondered, well, why in the world she want to be in the hardware store instead of being in the petting zoo? And so she comes up, and, and he leans down and says, Helen, what's, what's wrong? And she says, well, Daddy, it actually costs 50 cents to get in. And so I gave my quarter to Brandon so he could go in because you've already always told us year after year that love is an action. Love is an action. How many know that girl got it right? That little girl got it right. Love is an action. And then my final point is this. Love is the best advertisement that we can give to Jesus or for him or for the validity of Jesus and the Christian life. Love is the best advertisement. Because Jesus said this. He said, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you wear a Jesus t-shirt and a big cross around your neck, and have a fish on the back of your car. Right? 
Is that how they know? <laughs> Some of the worst drivers on the road have a fish on the back of their car. No, he said, by this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. The world's going to know that we're Christians when we compassionately seek the well-being of the people that God has put in our lives, right? Love is the best advertisement. When you love people with a Christ-like love, it's going to get the attention of the world. Jesus said, people are going to know that you're for real and I'm for real. When we actually begin to do this love thing. And we actually begin to live a life and a walk of love. Last Sunday, Super Bowl, uh, companies spent an average of $5 million apiece for 30-second advertisements during the Super Bowl because they wanted to get their advertisement out there. And they wanted to attract people's attention. And every advertiser tries to convince you that you have got to have that latest widget if you're going to be happy in life, man. You've got to get this thing. But Jesus said when we love one another, it's going to attract the attention of the community. It's going to attract the attention of your neighbors. It's going to attract the attention of the people that you work with. It's going to attract the, the attention of the people in your, your own home. You know, if you live with unsaved people, the best way to get people saved is not to try to witness to them all the time. The best way to do it is just live the love of God through you. Just, just let the kindness of God uh, be demonstrated through you. Hallelujah. And that doesn't mean every single person out there is going to become a believer. But I do believe that when we begin to love one another the way God wants us to, they're going to sit up and take notice. Why? Because they don't see that kind of love. They never see that kind of love. They see selfishness. They, they see people trying to step on them to you know, elevate themselves and, and, you know, climb their way up the, the corporate ladder. And it doesn't matter what they do to you in order to get there. That's the kind of, you know, things that people in the world have to deal with. They don't see the love of God that's, that's willing to lay down your life. That doesn't necessarily mean take a bullet, but it means the daily inconveniences of life. It means doing what's best for that other person, even when you don't feel like it, even when it's un inconvenient at times. Hallelujah. Love is a command. Love is a decision. Love is an action. And love is advertisement for Jesus. And I, I feel like if you only get these two things right, right here, the only thing that you get right in your Christian life is loving the Father and loving one another you're going to have a blessed life. As I was preparing for this message, I, I realized how little actually I think about living a life of love. I think about a lot of things. I think about what I need to get done during the day and during the week. I think about what I want to do in my time off. I think about my family and hanging out with them. But I realized, it just kind of dawned on me, how little I think about living a life of love. In reality, the, the most important thing that I can do with my life is to love, yeah. is to love God yeah. and to love people. And that's the thing that I believe pleases the heart of Father more than anything else when we make loving our priority, loving Him and loving one another. How would it change our life if we just did like that elderly Christian woman and no matter what the situation and just say, I'm choosing to love. I'm choosing to love today. I'm choosing to love in this situation. I'm choosing to love you. Even though I don't like you sometimes, even though you don't have the same viewpoint that I have, even though I don't understand you. And man, there's a whole lot of stuff going on today that I don't understand. A lot of viewpoints that, that I don't get, you know, and you, and you hear some of the rhetoric that's happening out there and you just want to just shut people out. But that, that's not the way to do it. God said, no, we may, not, we, we may not always agree with and understand, but we can choose to love even if we don't feel like it. I'm going to love people that irritate me. I'm going to love people who are different than me. I'm going to love because... God's commanded it. It's a, it's a decision. 
and it's an action, and I want to advertise Jesus everywhere I can in this community. Let's stand this morning.